Eve have a wonderful time by Enid Blyton. A school friend of Julian and Dick had lent the famous five two funny old caravans, which were set on a sloping grassy hillside. On the opposite hill rose the old ruin of Faynite's Castle, whose great walls still defied the gales that sometimes blew over the hills. A very steep pathway led up to the castle, whose great stone gateway was filled with a screen of wrought iron. The only entrance to the castle was by a turnstile, set in a narrow doorway of a small tower. Julian, Anne and Dick had arrived at the caravans a few days before George and Timmy, because George had been at home for a fortnight with a very bad cold. When she and Timmy did arrive to join the others, they were given an excited welcome and walked straight from the station to the field where the caravans were. There they are, George. What do you think? Oh, they're lovely. I love the big wheels and the steps up to the front door. The red one is Julian's and mine, and the blue one is yours and Anne's. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yours too, Timmy. They're old traveller caravans, painted and made really up to date. They're jolly comfortable inside. Bunks that fold against the wall, a little sink for washing up, a small larder, cupboards, shelves, even carpeting and rugs to keep out draughts. Can I go and see ours, Anne? Yes, come on. It's just through here. Oh, it really is lovely and so tidy. I say, there won't be much room for Timmy to sleep on my bed at nights, will there? He can sleep on the floor on a rug, can't you, Timmy? There. He wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. He always sleeps on my feet. We'll see. Come on, let's join Julian and Dick. Did you like your caravan, George? It's wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this holiday. What are we going to do today? Julian, can I have a look at that paper you bought in the village today? If the weather forecast is good, we could go for a long walk to the sea. It's not far. Here you are, Dick. Thanks. Hello. Here's a bit more about those two vanished scientists, Julian. Listen to this. Terry Kane and Geoffrey Pottersham have been missing for two days. They were last seen together near an underground station. Since when, neither have been seen. It is known that Terry Kane had purchased tickets for flying to Paris. No news of his arrival there has been reported. Didn't Uncle Quentin work with Terry Kane at one time, George? Yes, and I'm glad I'm not at home today. Father will be rampaging about like anything, telling Mother hundreds of times what he thinks about scientists who are traitors. I don't blame him either. It leaves a nasty taste in my mouth to think about anyone being a traitor to one's own country. Come on, let's think about dinner. What are we going to have, Anne? Fried sausages and onions, potatoes, a tin of sliced peaches and some custard. Oh, fry the sausages. The first day they were together was a lovely one and they all enjoyed it thoroughly. They went for a walk in the afternoon, and Timmy tore after rabbits, most of them quite imaginary. When he was tired out, he would fling himself down by the fore, panting like a steam engine, with his long pink tongue hanging out of his mouth. They had tea at a farmhouse, and bought a fruit cake and ham and pickled onions to take back with them. When they climbed over the stile at the bottom of the field, the sun was going down, and the evening star was twinkling brightly in the clear sky. As they trudged up to their caravans, Julian stopped and pointed. Hello. Look. There are two more caravans here, rather like ours. And another one coming up the lane. It must be the fair folk. The ones the farmer's wife said would be coming here. There's no sign of anybody about. All their windows and doors are shut. There's one caravan quite near to ours. Let's look underneath it. There's a great box with holes punched in its sides. I wonder what's in it. I'll go and have a look. Gosh, there's something moving inside. <coughs> Timmy, stop it. Julian, come and help me. There's something in this box that Timmy has never met before. Hey, you lot. Take that dog away. 
What do you mean by poking into my business and upsetting my snakes? <gasps> snakes? George, it's snakes in there. Do get Timmy away. How dare you let that dog disturb my snakes? Get him away. Sorry, but please stop shouting or my dog will go for you. Go for me? He will go for me? You keep a dangerous dog like that, which smells out my snakes, and go for me? You wait till I let my snakes out, then your dog will run and run and will never be seen again. With an enormous heave, Julian and Dick and George at last got Timmy under control, dragged him up the steps of Anne's caravan and shut the door on him. Anne tried to quieten him while the other three went out to the angry little man again. He had dragged out the box and opened the lid. A great head reared itself out and swung itself from side to side. Two unblinking dark eyes gleamed, and then a long, long body writhed out and glided up the man's legs, round his waist and round his neck. Anne was watching out of the caravan window, hardly able to believe her eyes. Timmy looked out too, and then stopped barking and hid under a table. Outside, George shivered, and Julian and Dick watched in amazement as the man fondled the snake, talking in a low, caressing voice. It's a python. I've never seen such a monster so close before. I wonder it doesn't squeeze that man to death. He's got hold of it near the tail. Oh, look, there's another one sliding out of the box. Now, you see how upset you make my snakes? Now, you and that dog keep away, do you hear? I don't like dogs or children, so keep away, see? I'm putting them back in their box again now. But you keep that dog away from them, or we might get a loving squeeze. Come on, Dick, let's go to our caravan. All right, Julian. We shall have to keep out of the snake man's way. He really did seem to love his snakes, though, didn't he? He certainly did. Hello, here comes the caravan we saw down the lane just now. It's got Mr India Rubber painted on the side. The driver must be Mr India Rubber, but there doesn't seem to be much bounce in him. He's stopped and is getting out, going to that caravan over there with Buffalo written on it. Buffalo! Buffalo! Hey, Rubber. We got here first. Come on in. Skipper's got some food ready for you. Buffalo was a huge young man with a mop of yellow hair, a bright red shirt and a broad smile. Mr India Rubber walked up the caravan steps and went inside. Julian, George and Dick returned to their caravans where Anne had prepared supper for them. While they were eating ham and pickled onions and cake, they could see more caravans arriving. Then, after a long talk about their strange new neighbours, the boys returned to their caravans. Anne and George settled down on their bunks for the night, and Timmy, after trying the floor and not liking it, scrambled onto George's bunk, gave a big sigh and fell asleep. Early next morning, they were all up and seated round a small fire, eating a delicious breakfast of eggs and bacon and piping hot tea. A lot of new caravans had arrived during the night, and one quite near to them had Alfredo the Fire Eater written on the side. I imagine him to be a big, fierce chap, a regular fire eater, with a ferocious temper and an enormous voice. There's someone coming out of his caravan now. Look. It's a woman. His wife, I expect. How tiny she is, and rather nice. This must be the fire eater coming up behind her. And he's just like you imagined him, Dick. We had better keep out of his way in case he dislikes children, like the snake man. I bet he makes his poor little wife wait on him hand and foot. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> his wife's chasing him with a saucepan. He's running away from her. It sounds as if she's angry because he burnt the breakfast. Seems odd for a fire eater to burn something he's cooking. <laughs> Though on second thoughts, perhaps it's not. <laughs> His wife's calling out something to us. Fire eating easy, cooking not easy. He is my big bad one, but he is very good sometimes. Poor Alfredo. He looks as brave as a lion, but is as timid as a mouse, really. There's someone else coming over to us now. Isn't he slinky? 
It must be the man who can set himself free from ropes. Hey, no kids allowed here. Uh, sorry, but we're caravanners too. Are you the man who can undo ropes when he's tied up in them? <laughs> Could be. And if you start interfering with us, I'll tie you up. We'd better be careful. They seem to resent us. Goodness knows why. Quite different from other circus folk we've known. We shan't make friends here very quickly. Look what's happening outside Buffalo's caravan. The children nearly jumped out of their skins as Buffalo stood and cracked his huge whip. Then a small plump woman came out of the caravan holding a cigarette between her finger and thumb and Buffalo cracked his whip again. And the cigarette disappeared as if by magic. The children could hardly believe their eyes. Buffalo could see the children watching him and went over to them. Clear out. No kids allowed round here. Clear out or I'll crack my whip and take the top hairs off your heads. It's our field as much as yours. We've got caravans here and want to be friendly. We're not doing any harm. Don't let's argue about it, Julian. They seem to resent us. Although goodness knows why. Let's go down to the village and buy some food for a picnic and go for a walk. While the others were buying the food, Julian went to the post office to get a paper where he was told there was a letter there for George. He gave it to her, and they all set off for a lovely long walk through the violet-studded lanes and over the heathery common. After a wonderful lunch, they lay back in the sun. Timmy went to sleep, and George opened her letter. It's from Mother, and to us all. I'll read it out to you. Dear George, Anne, Julian and Dick, I hope George arrived safely and I'm writing to remind you that it's her grandmother's birthday on Saturday and not to forget to write to her. George, your father is very much upset to read about those two missing scientists. He knows Derek Terry Kane very well and worked with him for some time. He says he is absolutely sure he isn't a traitor to his country. He thinks he's been spirited away somewhere, and Geoffrey Pottersham too, to a country that will force them to give up their secrets. It's just as well you went off today, because your father is very upset, and is striding about all over the place, and is really very unhappy. Have a good time, all of you, and don't let George forget to write to her grandmother. <laughs> your loving mother and aunt, Fanny. Funny business about the scientists, though. Although Terry Kane had planned to leave the country, although Uncle Quinton believes in him, it does seem a bit fishy. Anything new about it in the paper you bought today, Julian? I'll have a look. Yes, here we are. Missing scientists. It is now certain that Geoffrey Pottersham was in the pay of a country unfriendly to us and was planning to join Terry Kane on his journey abroad. Nothing has been heard of the two men since they disappeared. That settles it, then. Two bad eggs. Look, here are their photographs. I should think anyone will recognise Terry Kane with those big, thick eyebrows. They don't even look real. I expect he'll shave them off. Then he'll look completely different. Probably stick them on his upper lip, upside down, and use them for a moustache. <laughs> don't be silly, Dick. The other fellow's very ordinary looking, isn't he? Let's clear up and go for a walk, shall we? Otherwise, I shall fall asleep. If we don't, I shall melt in this hot sun. Good idea. Let's forget all about missing scientists. Come on, you lazy lot. Let's clear up and go. And you, Timmy. By the time they got back to the caravan field, it was almost dark. Very tired, they clambered over the stile and made their way slowly to their caravan in the corner. Then they suddenly stopped and stared. They looked and stared again. Their two caravans had gone. The four were completely bewildered. How could two solid caravans disappear into thin air? Then they could see the wheel marks leading out of the field towards the gate. While they were wondering what to do next, a crowd of fair folk came towards them. Your vans are not stolen. I will show you where they are. Come on, everybody. 
Where are you taking us? To the next field. Why? Because that's where your vans are. How did they get in there? We took them there. We hitched horses onto your van and took them there. But why? I don't want your dog worrying my snakes. Us folk and you folk don't mix. And the last lot of kids we had here opened all the canary man's cages one night and set the birds loose. So we don't want any more kids here messing about. No, we fair folk don't trust them. But we don't do things like that. No kids allowed. Here we are. Here are your vans. Nothing inside them has been touched or disturbed. Come on, Buffalo. Come, everybody. Let's go back to our field. You four children, stop here. And your dog. So that's that, I suppose. They're punishing us for what those other kids did. I hate the feeling that the fair folk won't be friends. It's silly of them. We're not used to that. It is a pity. By the way, do you suppose the farmer who owns this field will mind us being here? Oh, I never thought of that. This may not be a camping field, and we don't want an angry farmer shouting at us, do we? We'd better sleep on it and see what happens tomorrow. <coughs> That's one of your mottos, isn't it, Timmy? And his other one is, let sleeping dogs lie. Well, I'm tired and going to my bunk now. I expect everything will be all right in the morning. But it wasn't all right in the morning. A loud rapping came on the door of the boys' caravan before they were even awake. A large, angry, red-faced farmer looked in at the window and told them if they didn't clear out of his field that day, he'd have the caravans put out in the road. Before the boys could explain, he had walked off, a very determined-looking figure. Julian and Dick decided they would go back to the fair folk and tell them what had happened, and ask if they could be towed back into the proper field. But their request was met by an angry murmur and a firm refusal. And even worse, when Timmy growled, Buffalo, with a face like thunder, cracked his whip and whisked some hairs off the top of Julian's head. The crowd started to laugh, and Timmy bared his white teeth and snarled. Things were just starting to get very unpleasant when something unexpected happened. A boyish figure came running up the grass hillside, someone very like George, with short, curly hair and a freckled face, but dressed in a short grey skirt, and not in jeans like George. Dick! Julian! It's Joe the Gypsy Girl, who once got mixed up with us in an adventure. Julian, it's Joe. Dick, I didn't know you were here. And dear old Timmy too. It's too good to be true. Joe, where on earth have you come from? I've got a school holiday, so I thought I'd come and pay a visit to my uncle. Well, I'm blessed. And who is your uncle? Alfredo the Fire Eater. Oh, Dick, Julian, can I stay here while you're here? Are Anne and George here? Yes. That's marvellous. But what's going on here now? Everybody looks so cross and unfriendly. Uncle Alfredo, these are my very best friends. And so are the two girls, wherever they are. I'll tell you all about them and how nice they were to me. Well, uh, uh, you tell them, Joe. While I go back and break the news to George and Anne, they will be surprised. As soon as the fair folk learned about the famous five from Joe, their caravans were back in their proper place in the field. From then on, the fair folk could not have been more friendly, which after the unpleasantness the children had experienced until then was a most agreeable surprise. To celebrate, they went out with Joe and had a lovely day together, and on their return after a late tea, sat around outside their caravans watching the hundreds of jackdaws that circled round the old castle walls. Dick was following the flight of one of the birds through George's field glasses when he saw something that made his heart suddenly jump. He gazed as if he couldn't believe his eyes. Julian, take these glasses, will you? Train them on the window slit near the top of the only complete tower in the ruined castle. And tell me if you see what I see. Quick. Yes. Yes, I can. What an extraordinary thing. It must be an effect of the light, I think. Let me see. Are you being funny? It's just an empty window. 
Well, I saw a face, a face not far from the window, staring out. What did you see, Julian? The same. It made me feel pretty peculiar too. A face? What do you mean a face? What we just said. A face with eyes and a nose. A man's face. Did you notice the thick black eyebrows, Julian? Yes, I did. They were very pronounced, weren't they? Hey, eyebrows! Don't you remember? The picture of the scientist Terry Kane showed he had thick black eyebrows. Yes, I remember. But I didn't see any likeness because it was too far away. It's only because your glasses were so good, George, that we saw a face at all. I wish I'd seen the face. They're my glasses, and I never saw the face. I expect there's an ordinary explanation. But we could go over to the castle tomorrow and go up the tower. Then we'd certainly see if there was a face there. Yes, we must find out something about it. It's certainly very puzzling. Hello, who's this coming towards us? I can't see very clearly in this twilight, but it looks like my uncle Alfredo. It is. I wonder what he wants. Joe, are you there, Joe? Your aunt has invited you to supper, and all your friends, if they'd like to come. That's very kind of her. We'd be pleased to come, wouldn't we? Oh yes, thank、Great. you very much. Oh、uh, good. Now, if you come now, I'll do some fire eating for you while supper's cooking. Oh, well, that's that's brilliant. Brilliant. brilliant! Will you really eat fire for us? How do you do it? Ah,、uh, very difficult. But I will do it only if you promise not to try it yourselves. You would get the terrible blisters in your mouth if you did. Don't worry, Uncle. These children are much too sensible to try and do circus tricks of any sort. <laughs> Good. Right. Come on, all of you. Let's go. While they were waiting for supper, Alfredo gave them a fire-eating display. He lit two torches, leaned back, opened his mouth wide. And put one of the torches into his mouth and closed it. Then, as the children watched, fascinated by the extraordinary scene, he did the same with the other torch. When he had finished, and they were asking him how he did it, and he was refusing to tell them, Anne had a sudden shock. A long, thin body glided between her and Julian. It was one of the snake man's pythons he had brought with him. Joe caught it and held onto it for dear life. He likes you, Joe. Don't let him get his tail round you, as I've told you before. I'll wear him round my neck like a scarf. He feels so nice and smooth. I do like snakes. I really do. Right, everybody. Supper's ready. Oh, brilliant! Come and join us. I love it. I love the smell. The famous five went to their bunks that night, tired and very content. Timmy was happy too. Because he had a whole plateful of stew to himself, and had nearly got used to the snake, although he wasn't too sure about that. The next morning, as they had breakfast, the children discussed the face at the castle window again. They decided they would visit the castle and see for themselves if anything strange was happening there. They went up the path and came to the small tower, in which was the little door giving entrance to the castle. A strange old woman was there. Her eyes were like black beads. She had no teeth at all, and it was difficult to understand what she said. The children went up to her. Five tickets, please. You can't take that dog in. Can't we really take the dog in? Timmy won't do any harm. Look at the sign. Don't you read? No dogs allowed. What a silly rule. All right, we'll leave him outside. Timmy, stay here. We shan't be long. <laughs> Let's go on in then. Wait, we ought to get a guidebook. I want to know something about that tower. That will be five pence. Thanks. Is there, by any chance, a proper plan of the castle showing the dungeons and the towers before they were ruined? No, you'll have to go to the Society of Preservation or somewhere if you want that. Where? There, written on that sign. Up there, Julian. The Society of Preservation of Old Buildings. I see. Has anyone come from them lately? Yes, two men came last Thursday and examined the place. You ask the society anything you want to know, not me. I only take the money. Come on then, let's go on in. 
The famous Five and Joe wandered into the castle grounds and looked at the silent ruins in awe. The only tower that was not completely crumbling was the one where they had thought they'd seen the face. But even on that one, the stairway that led to the top of the tower had fallen in. While they were looking up and deciding that it would be impossible to climb up to the top slit windows, they had an enormous surprise. Timmy, how did you get in? There's no way in except through the turnstile. And the door behind it's shut. How did you get in? He's trying to show us. He keeps running to that small space between those fallen stones by the tower. What puzzled me is how Timmy got in from the outside. He must have run round the outer wall and found a hole. Yes, but the wall's eight foot thick. There wouldn't be a hole right through that thickness, would there? It's very puzzling. I'm afraid the old woman has seen Timmy. How did that dog get in here? Get him out at once. We don't know how he got in. Is there a hole in the outer wall? No. You must have let that dog in when I wasn't looking. Now, out you all go. Come along. Come along, all of you. George took Timmy by the collar, and the famous Five and Joe went out through the turnstiles. They decided to walk to the village for some ice cream and doughnuts. And while they were ordering them, Julian went to the phone box to telephone the Society for the Preservation of Old Buildings. The others were on their second doughnut when Julian rejoined them. You were a long time, Julian. Any news? Well, yes, but peculiar news, though. I found the number of the Society and asked if they had a booklet or something with the plans of any underground passages or secret rooms at Fay Knight's Castle. And did they? No. Then I asked if they could put me in touch with the two men from the Society who visited the castle last week. And what did they say? That's the peculiar bit. They said they didn't know what I was talking about. Nobody had been sent there from the Society. Hmm. Then those men were examining and exploring the castle for their own reasons. I agree. I can't help thinking that the face at the window and those two men have something to do with one another. It's clear that the men had nothing whatsoever to do with any official society. They merely gave it as an excuse because they wanted to find out what kind of hiding place the castle had. Then there was a real face at that tower window and there is a way of getting up there. Yes. I know it sounds very far-fetched, but there is just a possibility that those two scientists have gone there. I read in a paper somewhere that Geoffrey Pottersham has written a book on famous ruins. He would know all about Faynite's castle. If they wanted to hide somewhere till the hue and cry had died down and then escape to another country, well... They could hide in the tower, then quietly slip out of the castle one night, go down to the sea, hire a fishing boat and be across the channel in no time. Yes, that's what I worked out too. So while I was in the phone box... I tried to phone Uncle Quentin to tell him all about it and ask his advice. Did you speak to him? No, George. Your mother said he'd gone to London. To London? Father hardly ever goes to London. Apparently, he went about the two missing scientists. He's so certain that his friend Terry Kane isn't a traitor that he went up to tell the authorities so. I told her our news and she said she would repeat it all to Uncle Quentin when he gets back tonight and asked him to write to me here at once. The children went back to the caravan field and spent a very interesting day because the fair folk, eager to make up for their unfriendly behaviour, made them all very welcome. Alfredo explained his fire-eating a little more. Mr Slither gave them a most entertaining talk about snakes. The rubber man twisted his legs and arms about in a most peculiar manner, and other fair folk, who the children had not met before, all showed them their various tricks. The famous five had a wonderful time. After tea, they sat on the hillside with Joe, basking in the sun. Julian looked over to the ruined castle opposite. Have you got your field glasses, George? Yes. Why? Have another squint at that window. It was about this time of day that we saw the face. All right. Mm, no, can't see anything, just a... Uh... Wait a minute. Julian, quick, take the glasses. 
In the window. Well, we didn't imagine it yesterday, then. It's there, all right. And where there's a face, there should be a body. Right, that's decided. Tonight we will go to the castle and see if we can find out what's going on. All agreed? Yes, yes. definitely. Yes. I can't. <laughs> That night, wrapped in warm clothes, they waited till the moon went behind a cloud and left the caravan field. Not wanting the fair folk to see them, they crept like moving shadows until they reached the great thick castle walls. As they walked around them, Timmy, who was in front, stopped and looked back. He gave a little whine. The others hurried to join him. Well? What is there to be pleased about, Timmy? What are you trying to show us? Timmy! Hey, he's gone! Shine your torch here, Dick! There's a stone missing and left a great big hole. It looks as if the castle wall is hollow and Timmy's gone into it. Call him, Julian, and see where he is! Timmy! Timmy, where are you? We've hit on it. When this enormous wall was built, a space was left inside to make a secret passage. That missing stone has exposed a bit of the hollow. Shall we explore it? Yes, yes. great! Soon they were all in the curious passage which ran along in the centre of the wall. They soon got tired of going along bent double. It was pitch dark too, and although they all had torches except Joe, it was very difficult to see. Then Julian, who was leading the way, suddenly stopped, and everyone bumped into the one in front. What's up? There's some steps going down very, very steeply. Be careful, everyone. Hello. Here's another passage, and it's at right angles to the wall. We've left the wall now, and I reckon we're going underneath part of the courtyard. We can't be far from that tower. Hello. Steps up again. This is possibly a secret way into one of the old rooms in the castle. Gosh, we've come into a small room. It seems to be hollowed out of the wall of the actual castle. There's an old jug over there and a rusty old dagger. Who was here? And how long ago, I wonder. Look at this. What is it, Dick? Red and blue silver paper. It's chocolate wrapping. Well, that means that someone else knows the way in here. We'd better be careful. Shall we go on? Yes, we can be very cautious. Let's see where that passage over there leads to. Come on, then. Look, a spiral staircase. Go on up, Julian. We're right behind you. to a little door. Shall I open it? Yes. Go on. Okay. Good. It's not locked. That's funny. What is it, Julian? We've come onto a sort of gallery. So we have. It looks down onto another room. <gasps> the moonlight coming through that slit window makes it look very ghostly. Is there any way up from this gallery? We'll walk round and see. Lead on then, Julian. Shh. I don't think there's anyone here, but you never know. Come on, then. Hello. There's a flight of steps down into the room. And here's another door. Try it, Julian. It's bolted from this side. 
Is Timmy still with you, George? Yes. Send him up to me. Right, now, I'll unbolt the door as quietly as I can. And, oh no, more steps. We're probably coming to the tower room, where that window is with the face. We'll go up. Quiet, everybody. Timmy strained forward, but Julian had his hand on the dog's collar. They all went up the very steep, narrow stairway with hardly a sound. At the top was another door. From behind it came the curious sound of someone snoring. With his hand still on Timmy's collar, Julian pushed the door. It was not locked. He pushed it open. The moonlight struck through a narrow window and fell on the face of a sleeping man. Julian stared at it in rising excitement. Those eyebrows. Yes, this was the man whose face had appeared at the window. Julian switched on his torch and sweeping it round the room could see that there was no one else there except the sleeping man. Then with a sudden shock, he could see that the man's arms were bound behind him and his legs were tied together too. If this was Terry Kane, then his uncle must be right. The man was no traitor. He had been kidnapped and was a prisoner. Everyone was in the room now, staring at the sleeping man. Are you going to wake him up, Julian? Yes, I'll shake his shoulder. <laughs> who, who are you? How did you get here? And who are those in the shadows over there? Listen, are you Mr. Terry Kane? Yes, I am. But who are you? We're staying on the hill opposite the castle, and we saw your face at the window through our field glasses. But how do you know who I am? We read about you in the papers and saw your picture. We couldn't help noticing your... Well, your eyebrows, sir. We even saw them through the glasses. Look, can you undo me? I must escape. Tomorrow night my enemies are smuggling me out of here and over the channel to a foreign country. They want me to tell them about my latest experiments. I shan't, of course, but it wouldn't be at all pleasant for me. I'll cut the ropes. I've got my penknife with me. Oh. How did you get to the window? Oh, the... Well, each evening one of the men who brought me here brings me food and drink. He undoes my hands while I eat. When I get the chance, I drag myself to the window for some fresh air. I can't stay there long because I'm soon tied up again. That's better. Now my arms are free. Oh, thank you, young man. I'll free your legs now, sir. Oh, ah, thank you. Julian, I can hear a noise. Where, Joe? Downstairs. Wait, I'll go and see. Joe slipped out of the door and down the steep little stairs. She came to the door at the bottom, the one that led into the gallery. Yes, someone was coming. Joe thought quickly. If she darted back upstairs to warn the others, the newcomer might go up there too and hear them, and bolt the door. Then they would all be caught. She decided to crouch down on the floor of the gallery. Footsteps came along the gallery and stopped at the door that led upwards to the tower room. Then, to her dismay, she heard Julian's voice calling quietly down the stairs. Joe! Joe, where are you? Then Julian came down. Right behind him came Terry Kane with Dick, the girls following with Timmy. The stranger suddenly slammed the door and rammed the bolt home. They all stopped in alarm. Hey, Joe, is that you? Open the door. The door's bolted. Who are you? So you're back again, Pottersham. Open that door at once. Who set you free? Who's that with you? No, no, listen, Pottersham. You must be out of your mind acting like this. Kidnapping me and telling me we're going off on a fishing boat to the continent. There are four children here who saw my face at the window and came to investigate. Children? In the middle of the night? Well, how did they get up to this tower? I'm the only one who knows the way in. Oh, Pottersham, open that door! I I'm going back to get fresh orders. It looks as if we'll have to take those kids with us, Terry Kane. They'll be sorry they saw your face at that window when we finished with them. 
Joe, unbolt the door, quick! I can't open the door. He's locked it as well and taken the key. Well, you're still free. Go and fetch the police. I haven't got a torch. I'll never get through the passages. Oh, no. You'll have to wait till morning then, Joe. Although it won't be much better then, I'm afraid. All right. I'll curl up here in the gallery till daylight. The children and Terry Kane went back to the room upstairs while Joe curled up on the gallery floor. But she couldn't sleep. She suddenly thought of the little room where she had seen the pitcher, the dagger and the chocolate wrappings. That would be a far better place to sleep. She could lie on the bench. She made her way cautiously round the gallery to the door which led to the spiral staircase. She opened it and with her hand held out on either side, touching the stone walls of the curious little stairway, went slowly down, step by step. She came to the bottom at last, and remembered the little straight passage that led to the secret room. She went through the doorway of the room without knowing it, because it was so dark. She groped her way along, and to her relief, suddenly felt the edge of the bench. And then poor Joe had a dreadful shock. A pair of strong arms went round her and held her fast. She screamed and struggled as the man switched on a torch and held it to her face. Joe put her face down and bit the man's hand. He was furious and taking a rope from around his waist proceeded to tie her up so that she could hardly move. Then he left her with her hands roped behind her back and her legs bound tightly together. As she heard his footsteps going off into the distance, she rolled about on the floor and called him every name she knew. You! You horrible creature! You nasty great thing! Oh! Oh! Yes, but one thing the horrible thing doesn't know is that the rope man has taught me some of his tricks. Now, what is that? I remember. Always work one knot free first. At first you won't know which knot is best. But when you know that, you'll be able to free yourself. Oh. Mm. This knot on my left wrist seems a tiny bit looser than the others. If I pick and pull at it like this... I can just get one finger and my thumb free. Oh, good. That's better. At least I can move one finger and my thumb a bit. Now, if I roll over to that rusty old knife on the floor over there... Oh, oh, oh I can just about manage to pick it up and... Move it up and down until this rope on my wrist has cut through. And then I can have a go at getting... It seemed ages until the rope was frayed enough to break. It took Jo a long time to free her legs because her hands were trembling so much. But after a long rest, she cut through the rope and was finally free. She went carefully down a flight of stone steps, came to the wide passage that led under the courtyard, climbed the steps that led upwards again, and suddenly saw a little flash of sunlight. She stumbled along the castle wall and climbed back through the hole by which she had entered. Then she made her way to Uncle Alfredo's caravan. When she got near it, she saw a man walking away from George's caravan. She ran up to the fair folk. Who is that man going away from George's caravan? Uh, he was asking all about her and the other children. He seemed very angry about the something. It must be the man who tied me up, Pottersham. I'll tell you all about him and what's happened to the others. They're locked up inside the castle. Do you mean to say those kids are locked up in there? Are they alone? No, there's a good man with them too. He's a scientist. The man who just left said he was a scientist. Well, he's a bad man. Probably a spy. 
He kidnapped the good man in the tower to take away to another country. He tied me up too. Look at my wrists and ankles. We'll rescue them straight away. But first of all, we'll get that bad scientist. Right. Come on, everybody. After him. Within seconds, the man had been caught and neatly tied up by the rope man. Then, because he shouted so loudly, the snake man put him in an empty caravan with one of his pythons. The scientist stopped shouting at once and lay perfectly still, too frightened to move. Then the fair folk gathered together in Buffalo's caravan and planned how to rescue the famous five and the good scientist. When darkness came, a strange little company set off from the camp. Joe had been told not to go with them and was nowhere to be seen. Buffalo led the way, carrying his whip and looking very fat because he was wrapped about with a rope ladder. This is a rope with pegs thrust through the strands to act as footholds to form a ladder. Then came Mr. Slither with one of his pythons. Then the rubber man with Mr. Alfredo. Behind them, like a little shadow, slipped Joe. They soon reached the wall of the castle. Here we are. Now, we all know the plan, don't we? Yes. I'm the only one that can get over the wall, so I jump onto the top of it and roll over and drop down on the other side. And uh, when you give a low whistle, I throw this thin rope with a stone tied to it over the wall to you. Yes, and that is attached to our peg ladder, and I'll fasten it to something, and you others climb over it and join me over there. Make sure you fasten it properly. Now, don't forget I'm coming over with Beauty the Python. I don't want to drop her in the dark. Don't worry. I'll give a low whistle to tell you when to throw the rope. Right. I'm going to jump. Now. One. Two. Three. Ah. Good. He's got to the top. There's the sign. Now, I'll throw this over. There, he's got it. He's pulling up the ladder. Now, when it's firm, you go up first with beauty, and I'll follow. All right. It seems safe now. Um, shall I go up? Yeah, off you go. As quick as you can. Joe waited until the last one had gone up and went up the ladder too and landed beside Buffalo on the other side of the wall. He was surprised and cross with her for coming. Then, as the four men stood in the moonlight looking up at the tower, Joe heard a car going up the lane at the bottom of the castle hill. She heard it stop and reverse. Oh, no! It must be that horrid man, Pottersham, and his friends! Uncle Fredo! Uncle Fredo, I can hear voices. Keep a quiet, Joe. You shouldn't have been here anyway. But Uncle Fredo, I can hear voices. It might be those men come to take the children and Mr. Terry Kane from the tower. Clear off, Joe. But... Will you stop with this, Joe? You're behaving like a departing fly. I told you you shouldn't have been here. Now you are here, make yourself useful and hold my python beauty for me. Otherwise you'll get in my way in a minute. I'll put him round your shoulders. Here you are. Joe heard low voices coming from the other side of the wall. She was frightened that the Pottersham men were going to follow the secret passages and go up to the tower room before Alfredo and the others could carry out their rescue plan. She suddenly made up her mind. She would follow Pottersham and his friends through the passages and see if she could warn the others by shouting when they got near the tower room. She pulled Beauty off and put her on the ground, ran to the wall, went up and over the rope ladder in a trice. Beauty glided up and over after her. On the other side, Joe went to where the missing stone left the gap in the old wall. They both went through it and down the steep steps that led to the passage under the courtyard, then up steps again and into the thick wall of the castle itself. Passing through the secret room where she had been tied up, she went through the passage that led to the spiral stairway and climbed up it. She came to the door that opened onto the little gallery 
and slowly opened it. With beauty now coiled lovingly round her, she went into the gallery and stopped quite aghast. She could hear excited voices coming from the tower room. Surely one was Buffalo's. And was that a crack of a pistol shot? What had happened since she and Beauty had left the others? Of course, what she didn't know was that Buffalo had used his gift for knife throwing and thrown his knife high into the air, making it curve through the slit window at the top of the tower, where it fell to the floor of the tower room with a thud. Everyone in there was cold and tired and half asleep. What's happening? Something was thrown through the window. Look! On the floor! A knife with a string tied on the end. It's blunt and the tip's been filed off. What's the meaning of it? And why is the string tied to it? Be careful another knife doesn't come through. It won't. I bet it's something to do with the fair folk. This is Buffalo's knife, I'm sure. I'm going to lean out of the window and see if there's anyone down in the courtyard. There is someone down there. It's Alfredo and Buffalo. And I, I can't make out who the others are. Ahoy down there! Pull the string up and it'll bring our rope ladder up to you. Right. This string's attached to a rope, and that rope is attached to a rope ladder. How did they get there? Oh, thank goodness. Now, who on earth is Buffalo? Never mind about all that. Help me pull the ladder up, Dick. Right. <sighs> Here it is. Got it. Ah, well done. Now we'll have to fix the end to something really strong so it'll hold our weight. There's an old iron ring over there embedded in the wall. Oh, yes. That'll be safe enough. There. There. That's fixed that securely. Right, Julian. You go first. And then... There's some people coming up the stairs. Quick! Oh, no! Pottersham! So you're back. And with friends. Oh, yes. I'm back all right. <coughs> If you let that dog go at me, I'll shoot him. I've got my gun here and I won't hesitate. Timmy! 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 Julian, hold him as well. He'll fling himself on that man. He's so angry. Steady, Timmy. Steady, old boy. You can't behave like this, Potterson. I can, Terry Kane. And I'm taking you and one of the kids as a hostage. We'll take this boy. Get your hands off me! Hold his arms. Get Terry Kane, too. We've no time to lose. We'll leave the other kids locked in here. Parsham, you can't do it. We'll leave a note and let the police rescue them. If they can ever get up here. <laughs> right, take them both down the steps. Right, Chief. Come on, you two. While all this was going on, Buffalo, down below the tower window, hadn't been able to understand why nobody came down the rope ladder. So he had come up to find out. To his surprise, he could see there was quite an upset going on. He slid into the window. You can't do it! Hey there, what's up? Buffalo! Buffalo! Who are you? How did you get here? Put that gun away. You ought to know better than to wave a thing like that about when there's kids around. How dare you point it at me? Yeah. To everyone's amazement, when Buffalo cracked his whip, the gun disappeared from Pottersham's hand. It flew up into the air, and Buffalo neatly caught it, while Pottersham shouted in pain from his injured hand. Timmy started barking, and in the confusion, the men let go of Terry Kane and Dick. Then Pottersham, seeing a chance of escape, kicked out the lantern, leaving the room in pitch darkness. Buffalo dared not fire, in case he hit the wrong person. The door slammed shut, and the bolt shot home from the other side. We, uh, slipped up there, didn't we? Oh, yes, unfortunately. They've probably gone down through those passages, and as they bolted the door, they'll be outside long before we can escape. We'll have to go down the tower wall using the rope ladder. Come on, then. Let's go before anything else happens. It was perfectly easy to climb down, but it wasn't very pleasant to look below into the courtyard. They were all very pleased to reach firm ground again, particularly Timmy, who had been lowered in a sort of cradle made with blankets. At the bottom, Alfredo, the rubber man and the snake man 
were waiting for them. But the snake man was very concerned about something. Where is my python? Beauty? Oh, where is she? Where is Joe? We haven't seen her. She must be still inside the castle somewhere. Now listen, everybody. There's a terrible upset in the tower somewhere. Something's happening to Parsham and his gang. If they come through the hole in the wall, we'll be able to catch them. Something certainly had happened to upset Pottersham and his three friends. After they had slammed the door on the children and Terry Kane, the men had gone clattering down the stone steps. But Joe, who had stayed in the gallery with Beauty, still draped round her, had guessed something was going on and that the men she had met earlier were escaping. She pulled the python off her shoulders and let it flow along the ground to meet Pottersham and his friends just as they reached the gallery door. Jo hugged herself with laughter at what happened next. Ah, I should do with something. What is it? Shine your torch, quick. It's a snake. A snake bigger than I've ever seen, and it's got you, Parsham. It's got you. It's coiled around your legs. Help, help. Get it off me. He's slithering off you and coming after us. Oh, blimey, where is he? I don't know. Ah, oh, I've tripped over something. There must be two down here. Oh, I'm getting out of here. Oh, he's went round my legs. Oh, the horrible thing. Uh, help. Come back up to the tower room. Uh, I'm not going down through those dark passages with snakes after me. There could be dozens down there. We'll be safe in the tower room. Go on, then get on with it. Up the steps, quick. Right, into the tower room and shut the door. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> That's marvellous. Come on, Beauty, up the steps and we'll lock them in. There you are, Beauty. They can't get out of there. Well done. I wouldn't mind you for a pet if you were a bit smaller. I don't know why people don't like snakes. Oh, you really frightened them, didn't you? Come on, let's join the others. Jo chuckled as she went along the secret passages and finally joined the others who were very relieved to see her. But when she tried to tell them how beauty had terrified those four horrible men, she could hardly stop laughing. However, all agreed that she had done a very good job and Mr. Slither even forgave her for taking Beauty with her. Then they all went over the wall using the rope ladder and set off down the hill, talking 19 to the dozen. Terry Kane went off to report to the police station and Joe and the famous five began to think hungrily of something to eat and drink. As soon as they reached the field, Buffalo took them straight to a caravan. Find out if you know the fellow we've got locked up in this caravan. He seems the only unexplained bit so far. Come on out. We want to know who you are. Oh, oh, what are you, you doing here? Julian, I must ask you to go and get the police here. I was set on and locked up in this caravan for no reason at all. Is he your father? He's my father, yes. Why didn't you tell us, Joe? I didn't know. I, I thought he was the... It doesn't matter what you thought. I insist on the police being fetched. But Uncle Quentin, Terry Kane's already gone to fetch the police. Terry Kane? What are you talking about? Where is he? What's been happening? It's rather a long story. It all began when we saw that face at the window. I told Aunt Fanny about it on the phone, and she would tell you when you got back from London. Well, it was Terry Kane at the window. Ah, I thought so. Well, that's why I came straight down here, but none of you were here. Where were you? George's father listened with astonishment when they told of their extraordinary adventures and certainly understood from his own experience how frightened of Joe's python the men must have been. But he was delighted when Terry Kane came into the camp with several policemen who immediately set off to arrest Pottersham and his friends. After all the excitement, the children went to their caravans and all slept very late the next day. In the morning... Mrs. Alfredo cooked them all a huge breakfast, and while they were eating it, George's father came and sat with them. 
This really is a very extraordinary place, and most extraordinary people. Ah, oh, I'm going back home today. Wouldn't it be better if you all came back with me? Oh, no. no. None of us want to leave, Father. We're only just beginning to enjoy ourselves. Yes, Uncle Quentin. I think we're all agreed on that. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, I must go and catch my bus now. Is there any message for your mother, George? Yes. yes. Just, just tell her the five are having a wonderful time. <laughs>